So it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Uh, Jay Famiglietti um, is our speaker this morning. Jay and his research group focus on modeling and remote sensing of the terrestrial and global water cycles. Their work has implications for hydrologic and earth system modeling, for characterizing water cycle variability across multiple scales, and for monitoring changes in freshwater availability in the context of global environmental change. This keynote provides an opportunity for the wider community, or for us and those watching online, to consider the connections between what we observe in the field, what we model at small and regional scales, and um, how these processes and dynamics manifest at regional and global scales. Thank you, Jay, for accepting our invitation and speaking with us today. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for for coming. Um, so uh, it looks um, uh, looks great when I look out um, at this audience, and so I'm uh, uh, feel great comfort because I recognize uh, enough of the of the older folks uh, to know that uh, we're still still engaged. But but really, I think the majority of the people that are here, uh, I've never seen before. I'm sure a lot of you are are younger uh, graduate students. And so it's wonderful that, that you're engaging and, and that you're out here. So, uh, so welcome. Uh, and it really is an awesome facility. I'm so, uh, so impressed. With, so thank you to uh, Kwasi and the staff for, uh, and Brian for, for pulling this off and, and getting us out here. Um, you know, one of the things I recognize right away, so I live in California now. And um, so just a quick show of hands. Who, who is from west of the, of the Mississippi? Oh, that's good. All right, that's good. And so, who is from like west, like really west, where the river is drought, like Colorado River Basin and California? A much smaller number. Okay. Um, so, you know, as soon as you get off the the plane and start uh, taking that beautiful drive through the countryside here, you realize it's pretty green, and it's it's tough to really uh, understand, I think, and. Uh, uh, appreciate the difficulties that, that we're having out west, and, and it's pretty bad. Uh, but what I really want to talk about, so I'll talk a little bit about that, but also want to mix in a heavy dose of, of scientific communication and discussion of, of what our role uh, as scientists is in communicating some of these key things, especially, um, you know, when they're, when they're fairly compelling. Um, and I don't have any uh, silver bullets. Uh, uh, not not too many words of wisdom, just just experiences uh, that I that I want to share with you. Um, some of them humorous, some of them um, some of them disappointing. Uh, so I've called uh, the presentation today "Water Security in the Western United States" because I want to focus on some of the satellite work that we've been doing with uh, California. And then just the other day, we published a paper on the Colorado River Basin. And so think of this as an example. Uh, of science communication as a critical critical zone process because I really do I really do feel that way so just you know heads up I think it's our responsibility to communicate uh, some of our key findings uh, so what's what's going on what's going on in California what's going on in the western US for those of you who who don't know and I have to admit you know there's a balance between uh, communication and, and overwhelming people. And I think we may be at the point, at least with the Western newspapers, of, of, of overwhelming people. But uh, so it's, it's tough to find a balance. But so I don't know how well you can see this, but this is a comparison of snow cover in California in January. It looks like 2011 or, uh, and then three years later. So it's a bit like zero, zero snowpack this year. Okay. If we don't have snowpack, we're, we're basically in big trouble. And of course, we have to rely on groundwater. Uh, so there's lots of pictures like this around, around California of falling water levels. This is Folsom Lake, one of our reservoirs, and there's several other pictures like this uh, that, are, uh, that are floating around. Um, and so it's having its impact on, on agriculture for, for sure. Um, there is not enough water uh, to, to go around. Uh, farmers are having to take land out of production. Uh, some farmers are throwing in the towel, uh, and of course that's important in many different areas uh, with respect to the economy, of course food production, uh, with ripple effects across, really across the nation and, and really around the world. Uh, so farmers are going to use more groundwater. This is a figure that shows 
of the increase in the number of wells that are that are being drilled. I mean, if anyone is uh, benefiting from the drought, it's the well drillers. I mean, these guys are booked months and months in advance. And so this is the figure that was in the San Jose Mercury News that showed that the number of uh, well permits uh, has doubled and tripled um, in many Central Valley counties over the past, uh, uh, just over the past year. Um, and of course, you know, what happens, well, I mean, we get groundwater depletion and we get subsidence, and some of that uh, subsidence uh, is, is focused. You can see the sort of the bullet region around the Mendota Canal, which is shown on the right uh, uh, with the darker reds, and so in some places it's a, it's a foot per year, right? So that's major, major infrastructure damage, some of which has to do with water and water transport, so it's sort of, a, you know, a, a positive feedback on the... Uh, on water availability, and this is a figure from some of our work that shows cumulative groundwater depletion in the Central Valley going back to 1962, and so it's kind of a, a one-way trip. Uh, so there are things out here that we're finding, there are things that are happening um, that we have to that we have to communicate, and I think the figure on the upper right is a, is a good one. And again, I'll share with you some of the struggles that I've had in trying to communicate this stuff. Oh yeah, to make matters worse, it just keeps uh, honestly just uh, keeps getting. It's almost comical. It keeps getting worse and worse. So this is just the other day, uh, uh, Lake Mead uh, dropped to its uh, lowest level. So in response, back in January, Governor Brown uh, declared a drought emergency, which you know there's a lot. So right there, there's a lot of miscommunication, right? Uh, so people in the state saying, hey, what gives this guy the right to declare that it's a drought? Of course it's a drought. Now, he declares an emergency, which makes funds available. Um, and uh, following that, you know, much of our water in California, much of our surface water, right, flows off the mountains as snow melts into the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers and then into these canals that carry the water from north to south, the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project. And so there are allocations. Right, the State Water Resources Control Board decides how much water is going to head down south. Well, this year it was zero. Okay, uh, so okay, let that resonate. Zero. Okay, so that means you're relying entirely on groundwater. Uh, president came out, great uh, photo op. Uh, the other canal, so the two big projects, State Water Project, Central uh, Central Valley Project, also set its allocations at zero. One of those, I think the State Water Project recently went back up to 5%. But basically, there's no, you know, there's no snow, so there's no surface water coming down south. Uh, and this was just the other day. California approved big fines, $500 fines, for as much as $500, for uh, wasting water during drought. So uh, it's pretty bad. The town where I live, so I just moved to, to JPL um, from UC Irvine, and uh, so I moved to a little town called Sierra Madre, uh, which has only four wells. It's not in a water district. And, and right as all this stuff was coming out, one of the, actually like the first week that I was there, there was a city council meeting and the decision was made and strongly supported by the, by the town uh, to impose mandatory 30% reductions on, on, on water. Uh, the irony is I moved into a new house, no, sorry, moved into an old house um, and we're renting the house and I could not find the sprinkler control box, irrigation setting. Uh, and so, so of course, right, the last owner set it to water every day at noon. It's like 100 degrees. Water for about like 20 minutes at a time. Uh, I finally found it. It was, uh, I looked all over the house and finally, finally found it after about a couple of weeks of poking around. Uh, all right, so then the, the financial impact, which may be the, the thing that really captures people attention, people's attention is, you know, what, what are, what's, the, what's the dollar value? And UC Davis report just came out and said, so far, sort of 2014 projections around $2.2 billion, and I think it was something like 17,000 jobs. Uh, it doesn't get any worse. I'll get back into this. I'm sorry, it doesn't get any better. It gets a lot worse as you look outside of California and you look at the Western, uh, Western U.S. So I'll come back to this one, but uh, uh, fits in that same uh, sort of negative scenario. And likewise, this is a, a paper that we published last year. Uh, on the U.S. about this time last year. Uh, and those red spots show areas of groundwater depletion and water stress all across the, the southern U.S. So I'll get back to, I'll get back to those. Uh, so uh, I, I pose this question to, to, this, to this group, right? As water experts, um, 
So, you know, by that I mean we're, you know, graduate students, we're professors, we're researchers and uh, practitioners. What is our role in communication? And that's communication at, at many levels. We're talking about to decision makers and to elected officials and to water managers and to stakeholders and to the general public. So I don't, don't expect a show of hands, but I, I do want you to think about that. And I, and, and I think my experience, at least with my fellow faculty members at UC Irvine, is that there's a wide range of opinions. And, and most of those opinions, that was a lovely ringtone, by the way. It's very relaxing. Uh, most of the opinions of my colleagues are, hey, we're just going to, you know, we're just going to publish this thing and we're just going to stick it out there and whatever, go write our next paper. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not really in that, in that camp. So I think that one of the most critical things, I hope I don't take the whole screen down right here. One of the most critical things uh, about the critical zone is that we do our part to communicate and educate on key water issues where we have expertise. And so I think that we can come at it from a position of strength because we have the peer review process. We put a lot of time into our research, right? We've all, we are graduate students, we've been graduate students, we train graduate students, so we come at it from, uh, from not from a political place, but from a place of, of deep knowledge and, and expertise. And I just think we need to take a step further and, and start, to, start to share that. Um, it was so good, it was worth saying twice. Uh, so I will draw some examples from some of the work that we do with the GRACE mission. I think many of you are familiar uh, with some of this work by now. GRACE um, is a satellite that was launched in, in 2002, still, still orbiting. Uh, uh, GRACE stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. It functions like a scale in the sky. Okay? As these two satellites orbit around, they are pulled or pushed around in their orbit uh, by how much, by, the, by mass changes on the ground. Okay? So if there's more mass on the water mass on the ground, say because of a flood or because of a huge snowpack on the Sierras, there's more of a gravitational tug on the satellites, they're pulled towards the ground a little bit more. When there's less on the ground because of drought or because of a lot of groundwater pumping, there's less of a gravitational attraction, so it's really very much like a scale. You know, if you're heavier because after dinner, you know, you get on the scale yesterday and then you went to the, the dining hall last night and you had the veal parmesan and the coconut cream pie and then more coconut cream pie, and you got on the scale again today, right, there's more of a gravitational attraction, more of a tug on your body, and it presses the scale down more. That's the same thing that's happening here. The, the satellites, mean when there's more water on the ground or less, it's pulling the satellites down. Uh, so by mapping those measurements, we can map out the places around the world that are gaining or losing water on a, on a monthly basis uh, for big regions, 200,000 square kilometers and greater, with an accuracy of about one and a half centimeters equivalent water thickness on, on the ground. Uh, so it's not, it's not perfect, uh, and I know in hydrology we like to do things at very high resolution, and us too, you know, we like to do statewide models at one kilometer and whatever, you know, keep pushing the envelope, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of value in this information that gives us, you know, it helps us see not necessarily the trees, but it helps us see the forest, and there's a lot of, a lot of benefit to communicating about the health of the, of the forest. Here's what some of the data look like. Uh, every sort of click here is a is a monthly uh, is a monthly change. Um, reds here are wetter than normal, and blues and purples are drier. Uh, so it's uh, relative to this average uh, over the last uh, uh, 12 years. Uh, so you can see that it's really blobby. I, you know, it's best to just focus on a region, say like the Amazon, and you can see like the wet season coming and the dry and the dry season coming. Uh, from here forward, I'm going to change the color scale on you. Okay, so forget that color scale. And now, from here forward, we're going to go to if it's red, it's bad. Okay, red equals bad. All right. Uh, so how does this how does this work? Uh, just to kind of review, really, what Grace is doing is mapping the gravity field, mapping this gravity field every month, every month, and then we're able to look at the differences in the gravity field. So which places are heavier, which places are lighter, uh, on a monthly basis. The main contributors to those weight changes 
our water movement in the ocean, on, uh, on land, in the atmosphere, in the ice sheet. Okay, so then when we're looking at land and we're looking at these gravity changes, we're looking at 99.9% uh, water, mass, water mass change. And the reason is because water is super heavy. Right? And it's the heaviest thing out there that is changing on these monthly time scales that is changing enough to perturb the, the, the orbit of the satellites. Uh, so some things to keep in mind are that when we look at Grace data, we're really looking at changes in total water storage. So if you look at this uh, river basin up on the uh, upper right, Grace is telling us the change in all of that combined, all of the snow, the surface water, the soil moisture, the groundwater together on a monthly basis. So on the lower right is a time series for from this recent uh, Colorado River Basin paper, and you can see this long-term decline, and we'll get into where that, where that came from. Uh, and again, the limit. So I often oscillate back and forth between 150,000, 200,000 square kilometers. We actually go down to lower, higher resolution sometimes. It's harder to go higher spatial res. We, we can go to higher spatial resolution uh, if we have more information on the ground. It's harder to go to higher temporal uh, resolution. There is a follow-on mission planned uh, sometime after I retire, uh, sometime about 2030. Uh, so that's great news for you guys because you have, you have plenty of time to, uh, to, get, to get ramped up. But one of the targets of that mission will be to measure the position of the satellites. And by the way, those, the position of the satellites is measured with, in space is measured with submicron accuracy. They're up about 400 kilometers. They're separated by about 200 kilometers. And these little perturbations that I'm talking about are sort of, you know, submicron level, micron level, and then the accuracy with which the perturbations are measured is sub submicron level. So uh, it has involved some real rocket scientists, but they keep pushing the envelope. And so the hope with the GRACE-2 mission, which is this mission, so there's a GRACE follow-on, which will launch in 2017, which is just like the current mission. Then there's GRACE-2, too. too. Um, which I feel like I'm on, like vote for me like uh, the American Idol 2, uh, uh, which will launch sometime around uh, 2030. But the hope is to bring the resolution down to maybe 50,000 square kilometers, and, yeah, maybe 15, 15 or so days. And that will come from improvements of measuring the intersatellite distance, which is hard to fathom because it's already at the sub-micron level. Okay, so we have been doing a lot. So I want to talk about some of the work that we have been doing to expose uh, and quantify groundwater depletion regionally and globally. Okay, so you've seen some of this and we know some of this, but putting it into a global context uh, and then communicating that um, and continuing to communicate that um, is a challenge and that's sort of what I uh, have uh, adopted uh, for myself as the, as the rest of my, my career, uh, career mission. Uh, so this crowd, uh, you know, when I give public presentations, I realize, I, you know, people don't know. Okay, so lesson number one, people don't know what groundwater is. Okay, so some of you probably knew that, but maybe others, uh, others uh, didn't know that. Um, the groundwater, huh? What? I mean, all the water is on the ground. Uh, so, so this is a slide that I show when I talk to you know, people in uh, a state legislature or, or, um, or the U.S. Congress. So it's, you know, it's a lot of water. It's most of, our, it's most of our water. It's the major water source for over 2 billion people. It supplies uh, almost half of the water for global irrigation in the U.S. It supplies over half of our drinking water, uh, over 60% of the water used for irrigation in the United States. Right, so to grow our food comes from comes from groundwater. By the way, in California right now, we're getting about 70% of our water statewide is coming from groundwater. Okay, uh, and where I live uh, in Orange County, it's almost 100% because we're not getting this uh, this allocation uh, that I mentioned before. And so this is when we're exposed, and this is when our vulnerability is exposed. We have this colossal drought. And we're relying on groundwater, and so right, it's the strategic reserve. But you know, in California, we don't manage we don't manage it, and in other places, we don't you know we kind of only do a half baked job. So, um, groundwater withdrawals 
can go unmonitored, unmanaged in most places around the world, including, it's not really most states, but it is many states uh, in the United States. And the lack of management is becoming apparent. And I think that we see that in some of these uh, national and global scale grace maps that I show that have big hot spots over the aquifers. You know, it's kind of an indication that uh, we're using uh, more than is, is being uh, replenished. And so I have taken to, uh, in order to get higher level attention, uh, this last sentence, this pose, so taking to, you know, repeating this sentence, um, this poses a considerable threat to our nation's water security. And it's, it's true. Because the approach in California, so let me share with you just a couple of scary things. Uh, so, go back to, so go back to California. Uh, so I've been making the rounds of uh, some meetings with some, with some of the statewide water managers. And it's very distressing to hear the state, you know, the governor appointed drought manager Right, he's at the Department of Water Resources, California Department of Water Resources, say, well, if the drought goes past, you know, another year, I don't know. That's what they say. I don't know. So, you know, I don't know. Uh, think, about, think about that. So I think that we have a role to help them think about, think about that. Uh, okay, so how do we get at it for, from Grace? Grace gives us in the upper line uh, so, so just to connect the dot between what I'm about to tell you and the last slide that emphasizes the importance of groundwater, it's difficult to put together a large area picture of what's happening with groundwater just from well data, right? It's, it's controlled, measured by different agencies, stored in a number of different places. That's why we need, you know, the data. Uh, efforts that we are pursuing in, in Kawasi. So it's tough to pull it all together. Measurements are made at different uh, spatial and temporal resolutions. And so the satellite picture, you know, it's a, it's a great complement to the very important data that we collect on the ground. And ultimately, we need to, to put it all together. We're starting to do that in our, in our research. So the ability to see groundwater, see groundwater from space, uh, is, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty important. And, and Grace has really helped us take a big, uh, important step in that direction. We're not seeing the groundwater, we're weighing it, right? We're weighing the mass, the mass difference. So the top line uh, basically says that the change uh, that we see in Grace is just equal to the, the, the total change that we get from Grace is just equal to the sum of the components, the surface water, the soil moisture, the groundwater. And so now that we have the GRACE data, if we have some of these other data, like on soil moisture and surface water and, uh, and snow, we can solve for groundwater, okay? And so that's what I've tried to show schematically. If you want to isolate the blue part, the groundwater part in the, in the cartoon, we have to remove the mass changes that come from the, the surface water and the snow and the soil moisture. We do this using other data sets, remote sensing data sets, data on the ground. Worst comes to worst, we use model, uh, information, often we do that for soil moisture since we don't really measure it. Uh, now, Central Valley, you know, I didn't realize how important the Central Valley was before I moved there. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was just, you know, something in the grapes of wrath. Um, and it turns out to be uh, incredibly productive. And these are old, these are old numbers. I mean, uh, uh, you know, over 250 uh, different crops, uh, dollar value of 17 billion per year, 2002 dollars, and, you know, 20 percent of the irrigated land, uh, second most pumped aquifer in the United States after the Ogallala aquifer. Uh, you know, the depletion and the subsidence has been documented there for a long time, okay? Uh, this famous uh, picture of uh, USGS scientist Joe Poland standing next to a telephone pole with the subsidence um, uh, marked on the, on the telephone pole, that's about 50 feet in 50 years, and it, it's, in some of those regions it still is about a foot, it still is about a foot per year. It's not, not everywhere, it's just kind of localized, but of course it's right where we want to put the high speed train through, right, in the areas of the highest subsidence. Just saying that's um, not, a good, not a good idea, of course. Uh, so how do we go through this uh, exercise of extracting or isolating the groundwater. So upper left, 
This is the time series of total water storage from gray. This is the total. And so if we subtract from it the snow water equivalent, which we get from SNODAS, which is the weather service product from Diane Klein's group, which includes observations uh, like the snow pillows and the airborne gamma surveys, uh, surface water storage from the reservoirs from the Department of Water Resources, and soil moisture, which we have to pull out of models, unfortunately. So from A, we subtract B, C, and D, and we get this groundwater uh, time series of changes in groundwater storage from 2004 through 2010. I'll show you an update to this uh, in a little bit. And so, you know, something that, that is uh, fairly important emerges. One is that there's this overall downward trend shown in blue, but there's the piecewise trends shown in red that I think are a little bit more important because they show pre-drought, so 2004, 2005 are relatively wet. You know, it's cool, the, ground, the, the farmers all have their surface water allocations and everything's fine, and then they start getting their allocations cut and they start using more and more and more groundwater. Okay. And in that time period, farmers use about the equivalent volume of, of, of Lake Mead, which is, you know, that's, that's, that's huge. And a lot of it's not coming back. And a lot of it's non-renewable. Okay, Colorado River Basin. This is just, so this was just published on Thursday. And uh, it's not, you know, we've done a few of these papers now, and I'll show you some, uh, some more figures. But this one, I, you know, I, I put it in the category of, like, well, there's a couple of categories we could put it in, like just when you thought things couldn't get any worse, but also, hey, this is not just another uh, of our GRACE groundwater papers. This one is a little different, and let, let me explain why. Uh, and let me explain that first. We are very focused in the Western U.S. on surface water management. We're very focused on Lake Powell and Lake Mead, mostly Lake Mead and the bathtub ring. Right? And so at some point we thought, hey, we should take a look at Grace and you'll sort of see how much water that is and what role the groundwater is playing. Because we're in a drought and we know we're using a lot of groundwater, but no one talks about groundwater in the Colorado River Basin. The Colorado River Basin supplies water to 40 million people, right? Irrigation water for 4 million acres, seven states in Mexico, right? It's the, it's the lifeblood of the Western U.S. If we don't take care of it, we're, we're, fairly, uh, we're in fairly bad shape. So we looked specifically in this drought period. After the reservoirs, Lake Powell and Lake Mead, have sort of plummeted, right? They're at very low levels in 2005. They're at very low levels and now sort of being managed, okay? And now we're watching them intently and we really focus on the bass tempering. So uh, we wanted to look and see what happened to groundwater in that, in that time frame when we don't really have the surface water. What is the Colorado River Basin doing with its groundwater? And so the upper figure is just the total, so we see the big decline. And the middle figure is the combination of what we call accessible. So yeah, you've got grace and you've got snow and you've got soil moisture, but how much of that, if, you know, if I'm a water manager, how much of that do I have access to and how's that changing? That's the middle. That's the reservoirs and the groundwater together. Okay, so it's Lake Powell, Lake Mead, and groundwater in the middle. So we call that accessible water. And the bottom splits up groundwater and, and the reservoir levels. And what you see is that we're managing the, the reservoirs. They're shown in red, right? And those huge declines that we see on the exaggerated scales in the paper are actually nothing compared to what's happening with the groundwater, which is very noisy and clearly unmanaged. And the rates of disappearance of the groundwater are about six or seven to one, okay? So the message that I have been trying to deliver and trying to, you know, refine and communicate is that the water secure, you know, we need this groundwater. We need it for resilience. We need it to get through drought, okay? The Colorado River Basin is already over allocated by as much as 30%, right? That's how much additional groundwater we need to sort of get through. If it weren't over allocated, if precipitation minus evaporation, if river discharge were enough, we wouldn't see groundwater depletion. Okay? And so if this keeps up, just like in California, we won't be able to respond to future drought. We won't have that strategic reserve available in, uh, in, these, in these periods of drought. And so we have to be thinking about uh, population growth and climate change and the expectation of of more drought in the future. So it's time for us, especially in the Colorado River Basin, to be thinking about groundwater management and including 
groundwater management in discussions of basin-wide water resources. I hope I communicated that clearly, um, since it's a talk about communication. Uh, and so the picture, again, getting back to this issue of uh, how California and the West fit into the picture, the, the bigger picture. So this is this uh, uh, paper that we published last year. And you know, it shows a couple of things, that there's a stratification between the upper US and the lower, uh, the lower tier of the US. The upper is getting wetter, the lower is getting drier. So these are trends in total freshwater availability. And those hot spots of the Central Valley and the Southern High Plains, right, so the big aquifers pop right out. Of course, the southeastern US is in terrible shape. But you know, if you, you were almost there, uh, if you go there, you know, we've been hearing about the Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama water war. So this is no, this is no secret. But it helps us sort of quantify the numbers. We could share this with, you know, with Congress. They can see it and they can say, wow, hey, we better, we should probably do something. Uh, now this uh, part of the talk is called doom and gloom. And so as we, uh, if it wasn't bad enough already, if it weren't bad enough already, uh, so we can look around the world and see it's not just the United States. So California on the top, and a paper we published in the Middle East last year, just huge rates of groundwater depletion. The panels on the left show sort of pre and post in the Grace Time series. Green is wetter in the early 2000s. Red is drier in the later, uh, like 2010 to 2010-ish range. So Middle East in the middle and, and India on the bottom, those are the Middle East and India are probably the hottest of the hot spots for groundwater depletion. Here's a, a, a figure that, uh, that Gordon showed when he gave his Wolman lecture, and it's still unpublished, by the way. Um, but this is the global picture of uh, what's happening with water. And so blues are gaining and, and reds are losing. And it's very, uh, you know, it makes a lot of sense. We've got high latitudes and low latitudes um, gaining water. We have the mid latitudes drying, just like uh, as predicted by the IPCC. A lot of the hot spots for groundwater depletion are happening in those arid places, right? In the world's major aquifers, like uh, the Central Valley and the Middle East and the North China Plain and India and Northwestern Australia, where there's a lot of mining, and down in the Guarani Aquifer and, and on and on. So it's not a pretty picture, and it's one that needs to be communicated. All right, so we have some things. That we that we need to talk about um, these these sorts of things. Okay, uh, it's pretty clear that society is past the point, especially in those red where all those red spots are, right in the mid latitude um, region, uh, that we're past that point of living on the renewable part, the precipitation minus evaporation, at least in those regions of the world. So we need to admit this to ourselves and think about what it means for regional water management, what it means for water security in these regions and conflict, um, and so on. It's also clear that, that there are haves and, and have-nots, right? And so the blue regions might be the haves and the red regions might be the have-nots. Uh, so we need to work to make sure that there's enough to go around, of course, but that, that, that's kind of a loaded statement because Working to make sure that there's enough to go around means a lot of different things. It means policy. It means interbasin, uh, cross-boundary, right, transboundary negotiations. It means civil infrastructure. It means legal and policy infrastructure. Okay, it's it means a lot, um, and I'm not sure we are prepared for what it means, and I urge us as a community to embrace uh, this issue and to begin that planning and to communicate the need uh, for that planning. And so again, uh, let me ask the question, is this your responsibility or is it someone else's? And I think that as scientists personally, I think that it is our responsibility and that's how I train my students, and they and they don't get to graduate unless they participate and nod their heads and agree with me. So yes, Jay, we will communicate. Uh, so some other things that we're finding that need to be communicated. Okay, this is an update of. So let me walk you through it. It's an update of our California Central Valley 
groundwater time series. Okay, so estimated by grace. That's the black. Okay, and you see that it goes up, and then it goes, you know, goes up to 2006, and it goes down to 2010, 2011, then it recovers a little bit. Right? And what about those blue and red bars in the background? Those are these surface water allocations that I mentioned before. So they are surface water availability to farmers in the Central Valley. So it's pretty clear that when surface water, it is shown as a percent of the allocation where 100% is the, your full allocation of surface water. So it's pretty clear that when the surface water uh, availability increases, the groundwater recovers. Right? And when the surface water, the blue and the red bars, availability declines, we hit the groundwater pretty hard. We have to because there's no surface water. So we saw a little recovery. Okay? And here we are right now. Here's our zero. It's actually zero and five percent, right? And so some of the things that I have been communicating is the sort of you know holy crap message, right? What's going to happen? Uh, what, what's going to? There's supposed to be a little question mark there, uh, a little animated question mark. So it's a different, different. I've shown a different slide here, but I normally have a little animated question mark that pops up right there. It says, hey, where you know where do we go from here? What's going to happen? Are we going to? Where's this line going to go? Is it just going to keep going like this? And you know probably as the as you know, near-term history suggests. So it, it just takes a while to get the, the GRACE data. Unfortunately, there's a bit of a lag of three to six months in the, in the GRACE data. Looking at this a little differently, um, this is cumulative groundwater uh, depletion, cumulative groundwater storage change. It's a combination, going back to 1962, uh, it's a combination of USGS data in the red line and our GRACE data in the green line. And the colors in the background represent the climate, wet period, dry period. And so the dark blue is wet, and the, and the white is a drought, and the light blue and light gray are sort of medium. And it's, it's, it's the same message, just over a longer term. And the message is we've been doing this for a long time. We get uh, a wet period, and we get a little recovery, and then we get a drought, and we get a huge drop. Okay? And then a, a wet period, a little groundwater recovery, and then a huge drop. All right? So to me, this, again, is just another uh, you know, a chart that should be shared with our decision makers to say, you know, we probably should be thinking about managing it a little better so that we don't keep doing this, but, you know, maybe we do this, right? Or maybe we do some replenishment and, you know, bring it up a little bit, okay? Maybe we actually spend some money to figure out how much, how much water is actually there, which in California we, we don't actually know. But we do know that the water quality keeps degrading and degrading, and the subsidence keeps increasing and increasing. And, and people have to dig deeper and deeper wells, which is becoming prohibitively expensive. Um, just a couple more slides on some of the work that we've been doing. This one is on drought. So here's some new tools now where we can use drought to look at extremes. So it's not, not just sort of how much is there in these trends, but how can we, how can we characterize drought? And, and so here's a paper from. Um, Elise Thomas is a recent uh, uh, PhD graduate who looked at how to characterize drought really all over the world, but just an example in the Central Valley. Um, so here's our great time series, and so we see the ups and downs, right, and the interannual variation. But now that we have this, it's so almost like, you know, again, monitoring your weight season after season, right? You kind of know what the normal ups and downs are after a long period of time. You can just take the average, and then you can see then what are the deviations from your normal fat period and your normal, sorry, and your normal lean period, right? And so that's what we show here in the bottom are the deviations, the deficits, how much drier than normal dry conditions, okay? How much drier are we than the average conditions for that time of the year, okay? And that's what's shown here for in the grace time period. So these, what's very interesting about this is that we're able to say, this is when our deficit period begins, right? Which is difficult with drought. Like, when does it begin? When does it end? This is when a deficit period ends, right? That's instantaneous magnitude. At this point, when we made this plot. There was we had a number that we could tell water managers, right? Oh, it's 25. The deficit is 25 cubic kilometers. That's when you have that much water in storage. You know, you've taken care of business. Okay. So uh, I think it's it's. Pretty important. I would be remiss not to point out that there is a downward trend there, but uh, it is also a very short record. So.
So we're not really saying that the drought is increasing. We can look on the wet side, too, right? How much wetter uh, are things than, than normal? And this is a paper that J.T. Rager did, uh, uh, applying the same approach, looking around the world, looking at what's wetter than normal compared to the Dartmouth Flood Observatory on the bottom. This is just a snapshot from May 2007. And you know, it's, a good, uh, it's a good fit. I'll just point out this paper, and then I'll go back to another slide. So JT published this paper like two weeks ago. And this paper essentially said, if we start incorporating GRACE data into simple flood prediction models, and remember, GRACE gives us this holistic view that includes groundwater. It's not just surface water. It's not just soil moisture. It's not just rain. If we incorporate it into simple flood models, we can increase the warning time, the, the warning time for flood potential. So we're not talking about predicting rain. We're just talking about how wet the ground is. Okay, and its potential for flooding. We could increase the lead time by, by a season, you know, by, uh, at a minimum of a season. So that's a lot. I mean, if you can increase uh, lead times by uh, three months, that's, that's a lot. Um, and to put it in perspective, uh, I'll go back to this, this figure. So JT was really looking at this spot, right? And here's the time series. And so, I don't know, you know, the, the way I express this one is that if I were a water manager and I were actually looking at GRACE data for the upper Missouri River Basin for this region, and I saw that every year the water storage was going up and up and up, I would pretty much start preparing for a disaster. Okay? And so JT sort of quantified that in, in that paper. So what, so what next? We're going to do write another paper. All right. So I'm starting to think that, and of course we do need to write papers, right? And we need to do the science, Absol absolutely. But I think that we need to take it a step further. So uh, this is an ugly slide, and my only excuse is that I got up at 4.30 this morning, which is 1.30 California time. Uh, so I just want to show you what we did with this paper that just came out on Thursday. It's a paper on the Colorado River Basin. I showed you a slide. So first and foremost, you know, we always, I mean, what do we really contribute? It's not having a big mouth. It's not being an expert. It's actually really being an expert. It's doing the science, right? Training the students, writing your dissertations, writing your papers, going through, you know, go to the conferences, get the pushback and the feedback from our colleagues, and then it's good, and then, you know, we publish it. So that's what we bring to the, that's what we bring to the table. We make it the best we can. But what I did with this paper, so it's not just publish it and then, write the next paper. It's like Colorado River Basin paper, the water security of the western United States is at far greater risk than we realized. Okay, number one, sound bite. Uh, and then communicate that. So I've been doing a fair amount of uh, work in Washington, D.C., and so there are a couple of key staffers um, that I've been, that have deep interest in the in the basin that I've been communicating. They've known about this work for a long time and have been waiting for the paper to be published. Um, so the green is sort of the government stuff. So the other, let me skip down to the other green, uh, the green uh, uh, line. I realized I was coming to DC, right? Uh, uh, called my government relations person at UCI, and she's just in, you know, autopilot mode, setting up all kinds of appointments uh, with Department of Interior, with Bureau of Reclamation. Um, so I'm actually headed to DC this afternoon. Um, the blue is sort of the media side, so we did a press release, okay? And we don't do a lot of press releases in, in hydrology. Uh, I think that we should when the, when the work is compelling. Uh, it was joint for UCI, uh, AGU, and NASA, and it was sent in advance to some of key reporters, especially those in the basin states, but then it gets released and people see it and, and, and uh, contact you. So some of you know I do a lot of writing. And so I wrote an op-ed. I was hoping it was going to be uh, in, the, in the New York Times. They completely ignored me. Um, and it's called How the West Was Lost. And it kind of puts these two uh, California talk and the, the, the California paper in situation and uh, the Colorado River Basin together and just saying, hey, we're in trouble here in the West and groundwater is, is disappearing. And so I posted it in Water Currents, the National Geographic uh, blog, blog post, and emailed that. Now, that blog has way more reach, I think, than any paper that any of us will ever write. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say. Uh, so it's a it's a good thing. Um, 
and uh, orange is the speaking part. So try to respond positively. I get a lot of local uh, requests. So you're in the paper, and then people say, "Oh man, this guy's right down the road. Will he come and you know talk to the Rotary Club? Will you come and talk to my garden club?" And you know, for as much as I can, I say, I say yes. And uh, admittedly, Twitter, um, but it works, and people people follow it. Um, all right, this uh, getting towards the last uh, last few slides. So just to follow on. Uh, again, there is no substitute for the great work that we do. We have to keep on doing it. That's, that is what we bring to the table. But we have this knowledge and we need to communicate it. And that's to the general public. And so I do encourage you to participate in things like, you know, we have to get past this thing of like the outreach and the communication stuff as being soft. Okay? So that's an underlying message here. If your supervisor tells you, you know, it ain't real science, you should just say, bite me. Uh, uh, so to elected officials, look, consider the societal implications of your work. Almost all of us, I venture to say all of us in this room, work on some aspect of sustainable water resources management. Whether you're working at poor scale, at the poor scale, or whether you're looking at global or California or national level, we're all we're all involved. Uh, when you communicate with them, please uh, speak English. Okay, don't use jargon. Work on your sound bite. Talk to your water managers. Try to develop those relationships. If you're doing some important analysis or if you're doing some forecasting, I was very prescient when I when I wrote this. This when I said this, this slide I wrote a long time ago. I said it's easier from a government lab. And that, my experience in working at UCI was that people really weren't listening to me. But now that I'm at JPL, they're actually calling me up and saying, hey, what do you got going on over there? So some of that with the water managers may be a little bit easier uh, from, the, uh, from the lab. Uh, be responsive, be unbiased. Again, speak English, practice your sound bite because, uh, uh, wait, that's not supposed to be there. Wait, that's not supposed to, this is, this is the wrong slide. This can't be the end of my talk. This is terrible. Okay, uh, that's what I wanted to get to right here. Uh, we do need to elevate critical water issues to the level of everyday understanding. Other communities do it. We have not. We need to. We need to do that. Okay. Uh, here's some examples of how I've tried to do that and uh, how I've how I failed. Um, so here's, uh, or what the challenges are. So here's a blog post that I wrote on uh, the California drought, and this is basically what I, what I showed you in those slides, where are we going to go if we don't manage this groundwater. And so here's the challenge. This, these are the statistics. At the end of the day, maybe it was the first day that that post was posted. Okay, and I want to show you the competition, okay, and what other people are actually reading. Extinct Pinocchio lizard found in Ecuador. Nine things you should know about groundhogs. Bumblebees can fly higher than Mount Everest. Okay? How snakes fly UFO style. This is our competition. <laughs> right? Uh, some of you guys have seen this movie. I'm not sure how to start it without the keyboard. But this is just, uh, so the setup um, is, this is a clip from Last Call of the Oasis. When I went and told them about the groundwater stuff, and I want you to see what, what happened if you haven't already seen it. There we go. So there is, we need some volume. I can, you know, I've seen it a thousand times, so I could just mouth it for you. We'll see if it, we'll see if it actually happens. Harps sounded good. Yeah. Let me be abundantly clear about this. California faces a water crisis of potentially epic proportions. You know how we respond today will define who we are tomorrow. Here locally, we need additional storage. You know, I mean, they built reservoirs for a reason. Shasta, Uber. If you owe the bank and the county.
county taxes, you're going to try to farm as much as you can. They're not going to make more water. The only solution to this thing is conservation. I agree we should look into conservation, but that's not going to deal or have any effect on our groundwater shortage. I didn't want to, I didn't want to get into this, but your arguments about conservation and efficiency are just wrong. And if you're right that conservation and efficiency isn't going to get us anything, and if I'm right that there's not a lot of new supply out there, then what are we left with? Take land out of production. I don't know anyone who, I don't know anyone who wants that. Your arguments just don't make any sense. You have to live in the valley. You have to understand the management of water here. Well, that's bad management. And, and you're one of the managers. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to make clearly the statement that we do face a crisis now of, of, of epic proportions, and, and I said that. Um, and I'm not sure that it really resonated, which to me is a little startling. When we talk about water... We need a plan, and we don't have one, and it is complex. We're screwed, yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's that. Uh, and look, when all else fails, you go to your ace in the hole. It's the dog, all right? So we were trying to raise awareness of the drought on our campus. So if you've been to our campus, it's about as lush as a campus can get. It's green. Now, it is watered with reclaimed water, so, that, so that's good. But it is green, and like a lot of Southern California and L.A. region, it's really tough to, to sense that the drought is, is happening. So it's really, it's truly a house of cards. And so we're doing a class, uh, and we focused on the drought. It was an environmental issues class in the winter quarter. And we did a booth on campus. We were getting students to come in and pledge. The governor wanted everyone to cut back 20%. So we had students come in and pledge what they were going to do. And no one was coming to the booth. And so we had a you know, next class, and someone said, well, we need to bring a puppy. Let's have puppies. And that's my dog. So uh, took him, and it, you know, it worked like a charm. So hey, I mean, I think maybe one of the messages of this is that I'll try anything to get the get the message across. So that's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? I kind of said it in the movie, and that was that was also his answer too. I mean, his answer was we're in trouble, and so it's it's difficult, right? So I I don't have an answer, right? So I, I should have repeated that question. <laughs> so that was from Manu Lal who asked, well, what about you? Know, what will happen? So you know, your water manager uh, said, hey, if the drought continues, we don't know what we're going to do, right? And what, you know, what do you think that we will do? I don't, I don't know. And I think the answer is we have to prepare for that. And so that's why I'm in support of mandatory conservation, right? Of these fines, I think that they're a, a good idea. I don't know, heightened, uh, you know, major campaign. And I think it's at least in Southern California, um, it has to be enforcement, right? And uh, you know we could go on and on talk about agriculture and what could be done there to change pricing structure and, and a whole, whole bunch of things. Things like desal and uh, recycling are great in urban settings. They're not going to be good for for agriculture, which is all the water. More, Bill. The record is very clear that we're, we've been in a wet period, right? Yeah. We know that there was, the tree ring data tell us there was a 60-year period in which the average rainfall was one-half of present in California in the 1700s or so. 
there's a longer record that says we had 200 years of drought. Yeah. And we've actually been in a, uh, in a, geologically speaking, we've been in a favorable time. How do we communicate that and what do we do with that's, that knowledge? Right, so that's, that's an excellent question. So the first part of the, uh, so this is uh, Bill Dietrich from, from Berkeley. And uh, I guess you, you, know, you heard the question, there have been historically, we're, so we're in a relatively wet period and some of the paleoclimate and proxy data show us that things have been drier and droughts have been longer. And how do we communicate that? Uh, I think we need to work together and come up with a, you know, come up with a strategy. Um, that, that's, that's about all I can say. I mean, it's difficult to get that point across. Um, you know, there's different time scales of, maybe different time scales of awareness and political will. And right now we're in this wet period, but so what we have working for us, I think, from a, you know, from a water management perspective and conserving and thinking about groundwater legislation is that it's happening now and it's happening in their right, uh, um, you know, election, right, in their, in their election cycle. So it's happening. Um, but communicating the longer term, that's a much more, that takes some very thoughtful decision, thoughtful on our part, but thoughtful on their part, too. And so maybe we need to have uh, maybe more workshops and, you know, joint meetings with scientists and uh, decision makers to, to draw that out. That's an excellent point. Thanks. Um, just just to, to follow up with what Bill said and Jay, what you just mentioned, I think a really important part of that is when we're talking about the paleo record versus the current record is we're approaching 8 billion people on the planet. And it seems like with the public talking, this difference between a paleo record and currently what's happening, that's a really effective way to really put it into context. And I've found that effective. Yeah, too. no, that's, that's right. And uh, so that's an excellent point, which is to uh, – highlight the fact that, right, in those times, we have a far greater population now and much more ag uh, going on, so the demands on the water resources are, are greater. So these are all things that we need to work together to, um, to package and communicate um, effectively. So in California, you have the advantage, I guess, of being a semi-arid climate for much of the state naturally. So when you hit a drought, it's a dry place going drier. I lived in the southeastern U.S. for five years, several of which were pretty severe drought. And there, there was really no concept of water scarcity. Yeah. There were no management institutions built in to deal with it. There was no public consciousness of it. Yet your data clearly shows that the southeastern U.S. is drying. What lessons, either the, do, the do's or the don'ts, can we take from the western U.S. and apply to historically much more humid places, but that are similarly going to, starting to, and probably will increase the drying trend. So one of the things, so that's excellent, um, an excellent point. And um, um, when I do, you know, when you talk to the people who are in the water, right, who are in, in water, in, not in the water physically swimming around, but in water in the region, uh, you know, they'll look at the data and they will say, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's absolutely what's happening. Um, so I, as, a, as an educator, I always fall back on the following. If people understand what the sources of their water are, right, where it's coming from, whether it's infrastructure and a reservoir or whether it's groundwater or whatever, if they understand where their water, you know, the components of their water supply in a simple way and how those components are changing over time, then in theory, they will understand the need for conservation, restrictions, better management, whatever. So it gets to, you know, and we can play a role in that. How do, do we have time? Yeah. Uh, Jay, wonderful talk. <coughs> Great talk, really enjoyed it. Um, when you and I were in graduate school, um, the Ogallala Aquifer was a, was a topic that I think was fairly well recognized by the public at that time, at, that the world is drying up in Texas and Nebraska and other places and it's the end of the world. And, and, and there, there did seem to be a public awareness at that time, far beyond us. Texas has not dried up and, and blown away. And, and do, my question is, how do you communicate to skeptics yeah. that, that we weren't just um, uh, Chicken Little at that right. time, or still are, yeah. and so if there have been management there, but right, the public right. doesn't realize that. So if there's a, a benefit, say compared to um, climate skeptics, it's very tangible, 
right? So, you know, unless someone wants to doubt our well logs and thinks that we are uh, somehow manipulating uh, rates of subsidence, uh, it's very tangible, right? And so the water levels are falling, the quality of the water is degrading, and so it's much more tangible. I don't get that sort of pushback that when you put in a climate, right, when you put in a climate change context. Uh, so I think the reality of the situation, uh, the unfortunate reality of the situation works in our favor when it comes to communication. I think Larry, Larry Band has been raising his, that's Larry, it's got to be Larry, yeah. It's Larry, yeah. California was in a similar drought. Jerry Brown was governor, so perhaps there's a correlation there. Yeah. Uh, has there been an evolution, though, during the intervening time in, in water institutions, in water law or in water governance? Or is the strategy just hold out and wait through these major catastrophes and the memory is fairly short? So what do you do? Eventually, this drought will, will break. Right. There'll be another major wet period. I think uh, I'm uh, going to. was uh, a major wet period. That's what I'm going to build my swimming pool and invite everyone over. I okay. think with that. No. Uh, the quasi meeting the, is that your? Yes, it's, it's it's right. The, the, the new home. Uh, the institutions are evolving, and so in California, uh, the governor's office, the governor Brown himself, is very interested now in passing groundwater legislation. There's draft legislation on his website. He wants to manage, begin managing groundwater has reached out across the state, held a number of workshops with all of the right people. White papers have been written, draft legislation is on his website. The plan is to uh, get something up for a vote in the fall. So, so it is changing. One of the goals, so now the next step, in, uh, I hope, but I think will be much less successful with the Colorado River Basin because it's so many states that we can have a similar impact, at least in raising awareness of the, the use of groundwater. You know, it's not just Arizona. Part of the message, embedded message, it's not just Arizona, right? It's happening all over the basin. Thank you, Jay. Well, let's uh, thank Jay for his talk this morning. Well, that was a really nice start to the meeting. I'd like to go over a few logistics just to help us with the rest of the morning, and afternoon, and evening. Um.